Oh, yeah. Lighting, lighting, lighting. This section here, a long time ago, I was taught lighting in a very sound, fundamental way. And that method, uh, what we call three-dimensional contrast, my duck, okay? My daughter loaned me her duck, not willingly, but she did. And I created a section in this show to explain what I call three-dimensional contrast, which is the explanation of what you do as a photographer. Not how you do it, or why you do it, or when you do it, but what you do. Because what you do is create depth. You take a two-dimensional situation and you create depth upon it. Because vision is two-dimensional, it's not three-dimensional. Okay, if you look through two eyes, you have what's called stereo, but it's not three-dimensional. It's still nothing more than two dimensions compressed together by a stereo process. So it's really not a three-dimensional situation. On a piece of film, how many dimensions will your photograph or your transparencies have? How many? Pardon? Two. Two dimensions, height and width. But you're to create what? Three. Three, and really, in a way, four. And the fourth is time. Aaron Jones with a, with a hose master, great name for a product, huh? with a hose master tool that he has, which has a long exposure base of 20, 30 seconds, he's really compressing time too, isn't he? He has height, width, depth, and time. But really, we concern ourselves mostly with height, width, and depth. So my job is to make this duck round. So how do you make a duck deep? How do you make a deep duck? Will you create what upon this duck? Pardon? Ah, oh, highlights are one of them. Shadows are another. So actually, I create two things in this duck, don't I? Okay. I create an area called the specular highlight. Specular highlight is the brighter area. It's called the mirror, it's specular because it is a Latin base, the mirrored image of the area which creates the diffuse value. And then I have the shadow. So this, tone, this duck has how many tones in reality? It has one, right? The whole thing's red. I know, I painted it myself, okay? But my job is to create multiple tones on it to create depth, because without multiple contrast, I have no depth, correct? The whole duck is red, but my job is to produce an area brighter than and an area darker than what it should be. Is that not what I'm doing? Is the shadow a proper exposure? No, it's underexposed, is it not? Is the specular highlight a proper exposure? No, it's overexposed. So actually, I produce a correct exposure called the diffused. I record a correct exposure called the diffused, and then I create either specularity or shadow as a professional photographer to create depth to it. So in a way, I'm creating over and under exposures upon to a proper exposure. What's the proper exposure of the diffuse value? What should it look like? Whatever it is. What should a black duck look like? Should look black. What should a white duck look like? White. And a red should look red. That's my job is to create the, first of all, record the proper diffuse value and then create the contrast relative to what that diffuse value is. For instance, this is a red duck. I can use both specularity and shadow. But if somebody gave me a black duck, what would I rely on? What would I be thinking about creating? What would I be concerned with? Specular highlights. Not just highlights, but we call them specular highlights, okay? Because, because really in this case, this black area, is this underexposed? No. It's proper exposure, isn't it? It's a proper exposure of black. Okay? So I rely on specularity. But if somebody gave me a white duck, what would I create? What would I think of? Shadows. So I work with specularity on, white, on, on black, and I work with shadows on white. And if it was a red duck, I work with what? Both. Midtone aspect. Okay, now how do I get the proper exposure of the diffuse? How do I get that red or that black or that white? What, what tool do I use? Come on, jump in. A meter, I would think. Those are handy. Okay. Take an incident meter, incident meter, incident meter. Boom! Does it know what the duck is? Does it know what the duck is? No. But it knows if you do this, what it says there, because the incident reading in this dome is aimed at the source of illumination, properly exposing the area that that diffuse value is, in, reads F16, if you shoot at F16, what would be properly exposed on this plane? The diffused value. And how does, how does it, how's it done? Because what hypothetically is properly placed on this plane to guarantee the diffused value? A hypothetical 18% tonality, correct? Hypothetically, 80% is properly placed. If something is twice the reflectivity as 80%, it'll appear twice as bright. If it's half the reflectivity as 80%, it'll appear half as bright. 
but you place a hypothetical tone here, it sets it. So you set the key, you set the exposure at that area for the diffuse. But what happens if you have a black duck? What would that read? Well, and a white duck? So would you alter your exposure if you had a white or a black duck? No. Everybody's going, I don't know. It's called your lecture. <laughs> Because there is quite, because I still hear people on stage say, when I photograph somebody with really white, white skin, well, I shut that aperture down a little bit because they're so bright and reflective. And I photograph somebody with really black, black skin, well, I open up that aperture a little bit because, well, they're so dark. And I think to myself, no, what, what happens if those two get married? <laughs> yeah, you're going to walk up to the groom at the wedding and say, I'm sorry, sir, you'll have to step out of the photograph. This is technically impossible. I can't get both of you at the same time. <laughs> But don't worry, your kids will be zone five and I'll have no problem with them. <laughs> Obviously, you have to make an attempt to properly place. Three-dimensional contrast is often looked at uh, by commercial photographers as something they need to know, and portrait photographers uh, feel they don't really need to know it that much because they don't have to be so accurate because they're dealing on negative film, the lab will repair whatever they don't have in control. And that's really uh, uh, not true at all. It, actually, if you, if working with negative film, you choose not to keep control of the diffused value, you basically give up your true creativity. Uh, a perfect example is, let's say you're doing a, a portrait of someone and you wish to have a very light pastel skin tone, and you do that by overexposing on your negative the diffused value by a half stop, maybe a stop. Well, you send it to the color lab, and what's the first thing they're going to do? Is they're going to look at it, they're going to identify, oh, it's overexposed, and they fix it for you. You didn't want it fixed because it wasn't broken, but they didn't know that because all the film comes in in all different types of exposures because portrait photographers, by and large, do not discipline themselves as a commercial photographer will, which is making a living on ectochrome. It's obvious why we just, uh, discipline ourselves on ectochrome, because we're in charge. But if you leave the lab in charge, then basically they take control of what they think you're trying to say. So to understand three-dimensional contrast for the portrait photographer is one way of taking back total creativity and predictability of their photography.